Today we will talk a little bit about the early development of paper-based ship design. Not necessarily paper, but uh, what was known as molding of the vessel rather than the putting it together. We have already spoken before about the early treatises from the Mediterranean, the early Venetian treatises, probably mostly the derived from the earlier Byzantine period, because we do see that these treatises emerge only after the Fourth Crusade has captured uh, Constantinople. So, what were the next stages? In the 16th century, began to emerge an entire series of shipbuilding treatises with focus mostly, of course, on uh, design rather than the construction that, after all, was the prerogative. Pretty much any ship carpenter knew how to put together a vessel. The more interesting part for many of the early authors was how do you shape it? How do you design a vessel that will serve the purposes? In the beginning, there were, of course, mostly the best known, I should say, are the Iberian treatises. La Bania, Fernandez, all of them date from the tail end of the 16th and the beginning of the 17th century. Uh, some have been republished in more recent years. They might even be available from used bookstores, good collectible uh, bookstores. The problem, of course, is that their prices are uh, such that they probably can feed a moderate family within, let's say, A few days. More important, more to our point, the next big group of treatises, of course, are uh, the English language ones. One of the interesting, well preserved early English treatises from the late Elizabethan period are the notes of the great shipwright Matthew Baker. He was considered to be one of the foremost shipwrights of the later 16th century. He had studied earlier in his life uh, in Venice, or at least he had visited Venice, and collected different midship sections that he recorded in the treatise. The treatise is popularly known as elements of ancient English shipwrightry, but objectively, this is not the real title. This is the title that uh, Samuel Pipps gave it. And he found in the archives of the Navy this treatise somehow, laid his hands on it and confiscated it as he did with many other documents that he considered his private property rather than the National Archival, Archives of the Navy. Be this as it may, the treatise survives to the present day and it is at uh, Cambridge University in the United Kingdom in uh, the Papisian Library at Magdalen College. It is a very interesting treatise. It is watercolored much of it, and it is showing the early stages of molding a vessel. After that, from the early 17th century, there are at least four or five, although I myself have seen fewer than this. Uh, some of them are in private collections, some were so-called Admiralty Treaties, that is in private collection. All of them are very interesting, all of them are very important. They are showing essentially the same style of uh, shaping the vessel, molding the vessel, as the contemporary term was. So how was this really done? In the early stages of uh, ship drawings, by the 16th century, and this is illustrated in the elements of ancient English shipwrightry, Matthew Baker was already suggesting that the inspiration for the shape of a vessel should be good old mother nature. That if fish especially are fuller forward and getting narrower towards the tail. And everybody knows that fish float in the sea quite successfully and live there. Therefore, you should be trying to um, replicate this shape when you're designing a vessel. In fact, he provides an illustration of an Elizabethan galleon. And in the water, underwater part of the vessel, there is a fish inscribed into it. Implying. So that is why the cod's head and tail shape became popular. Ships should be fuller forward, 
narrowing towards the rudder. They completely fully well re understood that the narrower the run of the ship, that is to say the aft part that leads towards the rudder, uh, the narrower that uh, part of the vessel is, the better the ship steers. They did not necessarily understand the physics behind it and could not necessarily explain it in the way a modern physicist would do it, fluid dynamic uh, specialist would do it, but the basic principles, the common sense behind it, they understood perfectly well, as far back uh, as then. They also recognized that the ship design is always going to be some kind of a compromise. You either uh, get a narrower, faster sailing vessel, or uh, you get a capacious vessel, but you can't get both at the same time, for the same size. In much of the early naval tactics, and of course most of the treatises that we have are dealing specifically with naval tactics, uh, specifically with naval construction, I should say, it's pretty much until the middle of the 17th century, the emphasis was on fast sailing, sailing maneuverable vessels. The argument was that the nimble, smaller, middling sized ship uh, especially is the most useful one because it can carry sufficiently heavy artillery to be a uh, danger to the enemy and at the same time it is uh, quick in stays, it can maneuver rapidly and can fire one broadside, turn and fire the second broadside in a much more efficient way than a larger heavier vessel. In fact this was much of the early criticism of the very large capital ships like Prince Royale Sovereign of the Seas, the future uh, so royal sovereign. There was a point, but this was because they were thinking still of Elizabethan privateering rather than really proper naval warfare as it developed in the 17th century. And of course that gradually changed in the early part of the 17th century. By the mid 17th century the line of battle was established, it hardly matters for our conversation now who exactly established it. The truth of the matter is that line of battle had been employed before. Albuquerque employed it in his fight against the Arab fleet where his 11 caravels managed to defeat the 200 Arab vessels that opposed him as early as the beginning of the 16th century. Um, the great Martin Tromp, essentially on the first uh, day of the fight that will culminate in 1639 in the Channel, in the Battle of the Downs, he, as he was outnumbered by the Spaniards, employed line of battle tactics to offset his inferiority in numbers. By the 17th century this has changed, by the mid 17th century the line of battle was the dominant tactics and this cut down the emphasis on fast sailing and quickly tacking vessels because it so and so a fleet will always be sailing at the speed of the slowest ship. Suddenly other things became more important and leading lights in the design of the vessel, namely stability, the ability to provide steady gunnery platform. Fantastic that your ship is very fast, what use is it going to be to you if you cannot keep your lower gun ports open in time of battle? It's not going to help you at all. It makes you weaker. So, breadth was added and the uh, length to beam ratio essentially started narrowing downwards. Stability became an important issue. No need to remind the viewers of this channel of certain disasters of the 17th century. And no, it is not just Vasa. There was a very well recorded case of an early Ottoman sailing ship that sank even more embarrassing the moment that it slid off the waterways. Uh, the moment that she was launched, she capsized before ever being fitted out, before even sailing the 1200 meters that Vasa achieved in her career. So this is the background of what is necessary. What were the requirements for the design of ships? How did people approach it as early, 
We have already discussed many roads, we have discussed other examples of two decker, so that was already an established practice by the end of the century. We already discussed the desire to imitate nature, as nature would provide seaworthy vessels, it was believed. What is the next stage? The next stage, of course, was how do you translate these theoretical concepts this uh, requirement for the vessel, how do you translate it on paper, or rather into a design of a vessel? And that is when a geometrical system was developed that used arcs of a circle with varying radii that would produce the midship section of the vessel. And that midship section of the vessel would subsequently be um, modified, incrementally modified, to shape the rest of the vessel. In fact, this is exactly what hull molding means. means. It means that you're molding the entire vessel using exactly the same parameters, exactly the same uh, pattern, by simply narrowing it and rising it upwards. Various techniques were proposed for this. Um, shipwrights argued back and forth what are the best proportions. How do you control this narrowing? And uh, it is quite interesting. We, we constantly read in secondary literature, especially ship modelers literature, but not only. Unfortunately, this has made its way even into secondary historical literature that, you see, shipwrights in this period were ignoramuses. They couldn't read and write. They couldn't write their names. They were building by eye and experience. They just would create one or two modes and then uh, attach battens to them and fill the rest of the timber this way because they couldn't calculate anything. Oh, really? The first publications of logarithms, for example, emerged around 1609 1610-ish in English. The two treatises that are better known and uh, frequently republished and which date from around 1620 to 1625 both of them utilize logarithms. And in both of them, logarithm is not treated as, oh, here, look how smart I am, I'm going to be using uh, logarithm now. What an innovation. Not at all. The argument there is not whether to use logarithm. The uh, argument is which logarithm provides the best curve for what type of ship. In other words, the whole sense that one gets from reading these is that these have already been used. This is not new. The logarithm as such is not new to use in ship design. What is new is my curve is better than the one you are proposing. Basically, this is the argument. And that I find extremely impressive, but it also is defeating and sending to high hell the concept of the ignoramus, ignorant, co deeply, con stupidly conservative shipwright who builds only what he's used to building. I see nothing conservative or illiterate in utilizing logarithms barely 10 years after they're first published and publicized by mathematicians in England. That does not say conservative to me. This does not say, ignorant or illiterate. Next time we will be talking a little bit more about the actual process of design. How was this done and how the system was modified. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for sponsoring the channel. I wish you all the best for the rest of your day. Thank you.